Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, today we are going to focus on the topic, the body and the way it communicates. Now this is an area which uh, I have touched upon in some of my earlier talks and today we are going to focus in a detailed way on the nonverbal dimension which uh, has already been touched upon. So if you are looking at uh, <coughs> the slides, you will find that uh, I will give you a general introduction to different dimensions, different aspects of body language by which I mean uh, gestures and postures because facial expression is something which I will take care of at a later point of time. Then we will focus on gestures specifically and implicitly on postures. Certain aspects of space and territory I will share with you anecdot in an anecdotical way. Then we will go for an analysis of some images, some certain images and with that we will conclude this part of the talk. So, <coughs> there are a lot of theories, I am just uh, looking at uh, one research which suggests that uh, when we communicate uh, the, the textual message carries only 7 percent of the information tone of the voice, pauses, stress patterns and all kinds of things that we talked about in some of the earlier classes contribute to around 38 percent and nonverbal to 55 percent. But these uh, statements are kind of sweeping generalizations I would say because a study has been done within a particular context and within that particular context probably it has been found that this is the story. For instance, if you are looking at uh, the context today where I am talking to you then obviously, the message content is not 7 percent, it has to be much higher than that. And in fact, voice and nonverbal communication would play a marginal role uh, in the entire transaction and uh, interaction, because you see that uh, you are not so much bothered about uh, what I look like, which probably would reverse this mechanism, 7 percent you are bothered about what I look like. Voice and tone maybe you would still be bothered about 25 to 30 percent because it relates to interest generation and all that. It can be irritable, it can be uh, exciting or interesting, the voice qualities can communicate these things, but the message content probably is more than 50 percent. You are basically concerned about what I am saying rather than how I am saying it and what I look like. Look like. So, the context is relevant, but in certain contexts, the nonverbal communication component is fairly significant. This is what we gather from here. Again, uh, another very well known st study by Bird Whistle uh, found that uh, on an average people talk around 10 to 11 in, um, minutes a day and face to face communication and nonverbal communication play a much more significant role. But my personal experience tells me that uh, probably in a place like IIT Kharagpur, we talk around 2 to 3 hours a day and if you are looking at uh, the students as well, you find that in spite of uh, the number of hours they sit inside the classes, they still would be speaking for 2 to 3 hours if not more than that. So, again we will not go for these over generalizations which you find in many of the body language nonverbal uh, communication books, but my understanding by looking at various kinds of research is that uh, well to a certain extent the significance of nonverbal communication at no point of time can be undermined, but over generalizing and over stretching it is something which we should not do. So, yes I do take from some of the popular books the ideas because it is easy for you to understand that, but interspersed with that are some research findings which I have understood which I have also conducted in certain cases and some of those findings also I would be sharing with you. Moreover, there would be certain very interesting tests that we will 
develop for you, which will deal with the concept of deceit or falsehood passing, because you see that that is one of the things I will highlight as we proceed with this text, uh, proceed with this talk, that deceit plays a very important role in our lives. And uh, I hope it will be fun for you to do those surveys, but you must do them, because their findings are going to be very relevant in the context of what we do over here. But moreover, more important, you see that as I told you, we have criticism to the over generalization of many of the popular uh, non-verbal communication and body language books, where they over generalize, context specificity is lost, something researched in a specific context is applied to a different context and the meaning changes. Culture, learning and behavior, these are things which are not very often taken into consideration in the popular books. Different cultures have different ways of uh, presenting facts. Learning and behavior are linked to one another and learning it plays a very significant role in behavior. For instance, when somebody comes to IIT, uh, he or she behaves in a particular way, but by the end of let us say 2 to 3 years, a certain kind of a culture has been acquired, certain language, let us say components are acquired, certain intonations, certain nonverbal displays have been acquired, which the person did not earlier possess. And these uh, play a significant role. So, well, body language is to be looked at very carefully. One of the fundamental components uh, debatable is cultural or inborn. What we mean by the two, because this is a highly debatable area and I will not go into the theories of it, but what I will try to share with you is that, is it that nonverbal communication is natural or is it culturally acquired, socially acquired, the way certain aspects of language are socially acquired. My response to that would be that, uh, when we come to nonverbal communication, very much like uh, verbal communication, the desire, the tendency and uh, I would say the innate, innate uh, what would you call it for anything else, you would say you would definitely call it tendency. The innate tendency, intuitive desire to communicate is very much there through the total body. However, the way it is channelized, the way it is modulated, the way it is regulated is something which is determined by cultural factors. I will explain this uh, in a detailed way. For instance, when we are talking about smiles, we have found that uh, studies tell us that even babies smile, babies which, which have not acquired social contact in a significant way smile. But uh, the, the concept of meaningfulness of these smiles is something which is questionable. But even so, other studies have shown that uh, when people smile, there is a physiological trans transformation which takes place. Paul Ekman, for instance, suggests that smiling constantly might make you at the end of the day feeling happy, to, uh, may, at the end of the may, day it might make you feel happy. So, what is happening basically is that smile is something which is probably inborn in certain way, but the way it is presented, the way it is regulated, the way exactly you smile is something which is a different story, which is probably socially acquired. Anger, agony, you find that uh, there are some primeval, primitive ways of showing uh, anger by, let us say, uh, bearing the teeth, which happens with most animals and it also happens with human beings, when they are very angry. You watch movies, uh, which where uh, you find especially Hindi movies, uh, where exaggerations are the forte, you find that villains and even heroes fighting, bearing their teeth. So, anger, agony, fear, there are some certain physiological symptoms, we will talk about that. But if we ask the question, are they the same in all cultures, we have answers which vary. In fact, when we do facial expressions, I will discuss with you how Paul Ekman did studies with aboriginal cultures and found that certain facial expressions persisted across cultures. So, if you are looking at uh, uh, the other aspect of things, understanding body language, some are better than others. Well. Yes, it is true that some people can understand body language more intuitively or more conversant. The way some people are better at speaking a language and some people have to acquire that skill. So, if I am sharing something about body language, that implies that 
probably this talk will benefit you a little and it will suggest ways that you can improve your understanding of nonverbal communication and body language, which tells us very simply that yes, body language skills can be acquired. The way at a later point we will discuss creativity or certain creative idea skills can be acquired. Now, talking about uh, <coughs> body language and culture, the, the fundamental expressions of emotions and nonverbal communication, probably I would like to spend a little more time on this before we go on to other things, because a clear understanding of some of the basic things is much better and then you can always refer to other books. So, what we are talking about is let us say that uh, we, we consider that there are some fundamental emotions which are expressed through the body as well as through facial expressions as well as through whatever we say and the way we say it. And if we roughly categorize them into 6 or 7 for the timing, because there is again a lot of debate about how many emotions uh, primary emotions are there. Then we see that uh, for instance happiness is something which almost is universal. So, is sadness, let us say so is anger, fear, disgust, surprise and according to certain theorists even scorn, which are not socially learned. Let us say that, let us assume for the timing that they are acquired, uh, they are not acquired, they have been there, they have been given to us, they have been, we have been biologically geared, hardwired to express these emotions in various ways. Now, assuming that, let us take up the example of smiles. Now, if you are looking at uh, the way women smile and the way men smile within a culture and you take snapshots of that in various situations, probably you will find a difference. In a similar way, if you look at young kids smiling and adults smiling in the same culture, probably you will find a difference. In a same way, in the same way, if you are looking at uh, different social strata, people from different social strata smiling in social events, you will find that is, that is a big difference. In other words, smiling and laughter are things which might be innate to us, but they are regulated by social norms. In different societies, different cultures, what you can display and what you cannot is controlled. So, fine, if you are on your own, you are inside your room, you are smiling, nobody is there or you are laughing, nobody is there, you do it in a particular way. But the moment the cultural dimension comes in, the moment you are conscious of someone watching you, you would probably smile. Uh, in a very, very different way, because smiling in a particular way is expected of you. So, here is an example of a social norm regulating a behavior which apparently is spontaneous. The same would be sad about sadness, let us say. A very distinctive thing that comes to my mind is that at least in our culture and there might be many other cultures, where gender difference is significantly uh, uh, acknowledged, where display of sadness is something which is regulated in different ways for males and females. For instance, in India, uh, display of fear or sadness, let us stick to sadness by men has to be controlled. One cannot just about abandon oneself and express one's sadness. If you do not, if you are a man and if you do not do well in your exam, you are not supposed to, you are not permitted to cry, whereas a girl may be permitted to cry. So, these are socially learnt again. So, display of sadness, anger, a man is uh, supposed to in our culture display anger in a more distinctive way than a woman. So, you see that these, this is how cultural regulation of different emotions and the way they are displayed are regulated. These are known as display rules although we will not discuss it this in detail, uh, it is nice to share it and you can always look it up and find out uh, the fascinating uh, world of non-verbal communication, where so many other in interesting concepts uh, exist. So, here are a few basic examples, uh, just uh, for a quick understanding, nodding the head yes and no. Now, there is a lot of cultural debate about there is, a, there is a lot of debate about whether it is cultural or whether it is natural. So, you see that uh, studies, studies until this point of time have been inconclusive and we do not really know for sure which one is the case, but uh, there are traditions including in certain parts of India, 
where you see that when you agree you shake your head in a specific way okay but when you don't agree within the same culture you nod your head in a different way okay but very often in other parts of the country people confuse that where you say you nod your head in this way to say yes and this way to say no and this is something which doesn't exist in that particular tradition so there is a confusion but there are certain cultures and if you google you will find that it is the case that in certain cultures shaking your head is considered as yes now if you are looking at uh, the mechanism of language you find that uh, most languages begin in some way being linked with a natural cause if you are looking at written language uh, if you are looking at pictographs and seen pictographs the symbols virtually represent something out there which exists let us say symbol of a bull standing for a bull or a symbol of um, let us say uh, circle standing for sun and so on and so forth and then these get these symbols gradually get transmuted and the link with the natural world from which these emerge slowly disappear and uh, at that point of time a particular gesture or a particular symbol in this case a particular written symbol has although it is linked to its original meaning in certain ways you find that uh, the missing the link is missing you do not really know what has happened and how the connectivity can be traced. If you are looking at uh, some of the gestures uh, we make you will find a similar thing such gestures which have a specific meaning they com communicate a specific meaning are known as uh, emblems okay and uh, the function of emblems is that they specifically communicate a meaning which may not have absolutely anything to, to do with a natural orientation for instance certain emblems have a natural connection with what they suggest for instance this is an emblem for silence and this has a link with the mouth so you can say that well this connection is very clear or this is an emblem for drinking water or drinking liquid and it is there uh, there is a definite connection between the two but if you are looking at a thumb up um, a sign which is an emblem or a victory sign which is an emblem or an appreciation or a zero sign which is an emblem then you find that in these cases the within a particular culture there is a certain degree of agreement as to what it means in other cultures there is may not there might be an agreement as to what it means in a different way okay so if you are looking at some of the other things like sneer this has probably a biological origin because as I told you a little earlier bearing teeth is something which is there amongst many animals including uh, primates and human beings when they so want to display anger when they want to bite when they want to fight even today when people fight even professional boxers fight sometimes they bite one another. So that is something which is probably very much biologically driven but a shrug I do not know this kind of a shrug again we do not really know if whether it is a uh, it has a natural origin or how did it actually emerge but there must be a, must be a link to some kind of a natural origin. For instance some of the uh, emblems that we use okay, like I come in peace okay, palm up sign waving a goodbye these have uh, these are at least at a certain point of time were biologically driven that is what we get to know because you find that in the early traditions in early communities people used to carry weapons so open palm gesture is a initially a gesture which makes it very clear that I am unarmed I am not carrying any weapons and with time you find that one instead of one hand, two hands you have one hand and these kinds of gestures gradually getting codified becoming emblematic uh, be becoming uh, very very symbolic so that the original connection is something which is lost shaking hands as a form of greetings probably also has to do with a similar kind of thing where the hand is empty without any weapon is something from which it might have started because you see that uh, among tribes in the ancient periods ancient times when socializations were getting initiated these gestures had something in addition to a social meaning they had a survival dimension to it but these survival dimensions have been lost with civilization and what has come down to us is something which we accept we modify we change in different ways for instance uh, somebody tells me that in 
certain parts of the in Southeast Asia, uh, the namaskar that we use in many of the Indian traditions is prevalent. So, it must have been transmitted at some point of time and the gesture has been acquired over there. Okay. So, this is just to give you an idea of how, how things are ok is a popularized in the US in the 19th century all correct old kinder hook that is how the etymologically the meaning emerges uh, hand ring standing for O in France it means 0 in Japan it can mean money and in India it can mean appreciation. So, you see that uh, the same gesture ha having different kinds of meanings in different places means that it is a conventional language use it is not a natural language use. A natural language use is something which is transmitted or which is similar across cultures a conventional language use is something which is different for different cultures, different languages, different countries because that is where it has a specific limited meaning. So, thumbs up again as I told you in the earlier case ok, all ok or it can have a vulgar meaning or it can also indicate a sense of superiority. Now, these are culturally determined rather than biologically driven or the victory sign that uh, Churchill popularized Okay. and if the palm turns again it becomes a vulgar symbol. So, these and uh, Queen Elizabeth probably confused the symbol at some point of time it raised a lot of or I am I'm, I'm, I'm sorry probably Margaret Thatcher I do not remember who, but it finally led to a controversy because it was wrongly used and this can this these are very sensitive issues in social and cultural lives of different cultures. So, having said that let us go on a little further and tell that all this that we have been talking about so far focus primarily on the conventional side of body language, but most of the people are interested primarily in the non uh, conventional or the natural side of body language. Well, there is no such thing as that as I have already expressed to you, but uh, I would say conscious as opposed to unconscious consciously we make gestures which are very very important for soft skills because you see that you have to learn how to behave what to do what not to do what to display what not to display in a socio cultural context. So, yes in those contexts body language is important, but equally important is to guess the meaning of what somebody else is trying to say or guess the ulterior motive of what somebody else is trying to conceal. Okay. Now, this becomes a very interesting exciting challenging thing and most of us are interested in such a dimension of non-verbal communication as well, because you see that uh, very often the important thing is to find out what somebody is actually thinking. We use the term actually, because in social life we tell a lot of lies, but we will come to that in a little while from now. The most important thing is that like language, where you see that a word does not have a meaning without a context nonverbal communication also does not have a meaning without the context. The first component of the context are other gestures, other postures which together combined give a sense. The other part of the context is where somebody is making this gesture, the physical or the social space, the culture and various other dimensions. So, you see that this is something which is not new even if you are looking at uh, our ancient uh, book uh, on Natya which is a performance Natya Sastra these have been already well codified and we have a very interesting uh, classification of Lokodharmi and Natya Dharmi and uh, by Lokodharmi we mean that which is natural I would roughly translate it as that and by Natya Dharmi we would say we would consider things as culturally determined. So, that which is culturally determined is Natya Dharmi that is in the rules a practitioner of performance has to follow those rules and other people conventionally understand and there are certain natural behavioral patterns people display everywhere and performance has to acquire that. So, when we are looking at this codification we find a huge number of clusters of uh, gestures, postures, facial expressions and what they could mean, what they could symbolize, which god, which goddess, which particular social strata all this has been well codified for performance as well as dance from which most of our Indian dances and theatre traditions have emerged. So, 
as I have indicated over here, a solitary gesture can be misleading. You need a context, you need a cluster of gestures and of course, the totality of verbal and non-verbal quotes together imply whatever has to be implied. And ambiguity of meaning is something which is very, very strong over here. When you compare this with let us say verbal gestures, or, uh, so I am sorry with verbalization. Why is it so? Because you see that uh, at least words in most cases have clear meanings. We have already discussed this in some of the earlier slides and earlier talks that I had given you. But when it comes to non-verbal communication, you see that the meanings are personally interpreted. We do not have a dictionary, although attempts have been made, we do not really have a systematic dictionary of non-verbal communication, which we have to follow. The rules have to be followed. The rules are made by every one of us and at each point of time, we keep on changing these rules. So, having said that, I will touch upon two or three other important components. One of the components is the concept of power. Nonverbal communication presents a display of power and if you remember in one of the earlier slides which I had taken from Tintin, I had discussed this and uh, you say that uh, probably uh, the display of social status of power of masculinity of femininity is much more distinctively done in nonverbal communication than through verbal or vocal communication. This is something we have to remember. I will definitely be giving you certain slides which deal with these certain references. You can google and find them, you can have some maybe a one or two papers and ref books on body language which, which are commonly available, where you will get to know some of these issues in a detailed way. But very quickly, I will uh, talk about something which uh, is def significant in the context of nonverbal communication, which is the concept of Jones or distances, space. Now, space plays a very significant role in nonverbal communication. I will quickly share with you how many books have defined it well. It has a certain uh, significance and it is meaningful in certain ways that is why I am sharing it with you, which is that when uh, you are uh, very close to somebody, you can approach that person. So, the proximity is something which is allowed by two people. Hence, you find that these people can converse at a distance which can be considered intimate or personal distance. On the other hand, if you know a person formally, you will maintain a certain distance may be 3 feet or 2 and a half feet or 3 feet or 4 feet whatever it is and then you can call it a social space. Even in a classroom like this, um, there are maybe 20, 30 people at sitting at different distances from you, we have a social space, but social space is one where you see that you do not have to shout and you are still able to maintain eye contact, establish uh, your facial expression and other displays of body are distinctively available to the people and you can transact at that distance in a social way. So, space is still relevant over here, but a public space a great, much greater distance is one where you are at such a distance that only your gestures and distinctive gestures can be identified and nothing else. And uh, in such a space, you can only communicate very, very formal things and not intimate or social things. So, space plays a significant role in nonverbal communication in many ways, this is just one of them. The other one is space and the concept of territory. If I am sitting in front of a table, then generally I put things in front of me on the table. I do not and if let us say I am sitting over here and somebody else sitting next to me, I generally do not put things on his space or her space. So, why do we observe this? Because we have tentatively at some level assume that that is his space or his territory and this is my space, my territory and I must differentiate between the two. You find that uh, most fights on trains are about space and territory, because you see that uh, traveling second class or very often you find uh, people are crowded, uh, the, the space is crowded and people are not very comfortable. Initially, you find that they are steep, they are sometimes fighting very particular about which seat they have to sit in and gradually over a period of let us say 12 hours, 15 hours, you find that people are relaxing, they have met friends. Now, I am putting my leg on your seat, you are putting your hand on my seat, we are more or less comfortable and we do not mind that. So, these territories giving him a little bit of my territory to the other person, these social adjustments 
in the context of nonverbal communication take place and have symbolic implications even in the context of actual physical space and territory. For instance, finds research has found that criminals very often people who are violent need more space than normal people. And in a particular sociocultural context, what happens is that the person who needs less space assumes that the other violent person also needs an equal amount of space, whereas the other violent person is feeling uncomfortable and that probably gives rise to a lot of conflict. Studies have been done on these aspects of things as well. We also realize that space is context specific. What I may mean by this is that if you are inside a lift where there is less space, you follow certain conventions, you fold your hands and stand uh, in a particular way to say that I am not interested to touch anybody, I am not interested to take anybody else's space. Okay? Whereas you find that uh, if uh, let us say in a place uh, which is uh, much larger, uh, people are sitting very standing very close and huddled together, they have to be friends. Okay? Otherwise, if people stand huddled together, then it is something which some of the other group members will find abnormal. Okay? So, space rituals we have, we follow space rituals uh, in cinema halls, in public spaces, in different places and in different places we have different space rituals. In public spaces, sometimes space is constricted and we follow certain rituals like palm inside, okay, a protective gesture. And even if you are looking at your palm, you find that this part of your palm is considered more private than this part, which is considered more public. So, starting from posture gesture to touching behavior, here everywhere certain such social rituals are followed and we need to be aware of them. Now, culture and zones, we have uh, found that uh, you find that uh, in one of my earlier talks, I shared with you that different kinds of spaces uh, are maintained between males and males, males and females and females and males in Indian culture. You might find this varying in different cultures. Uh, and you see that country people and uh, city people behave differently when it comes to space. Very often you find that in a deserted late bus in a crowded city, if there are five people, they would be sitting in five different corners because they are not interested to talk to one another. After having spent hours after hours talking to people and socializing. On the other hand, if the same bus is traveling through the countryside in India, you might find that the moment a person walks in and finds one person sitting, he might go and sit down next to that person. Because here, people are not yet tired of having talked to one another. So, different places have different rituals. So, hand sex for instance in different places uh, have uh, different implications in let us say uh, cities where space is not there, maybe people shake hands like this. Whereas, uh, in a country or a small town, people might shake hands like this. And in many other places, sparsely populated areas like Australia, people may not even shake hands. And uh, because proximity brings us together and then touching behavior start. So, these are some very interesting things about uh, nonverbal communication. We talked about space and territory and space sometimes you find that um, uh, is very, very relevant. And uh, studies have found that even a small person who is sitting behind the wheels of a big car might certainly show aggression, because he feels that the, the car is an extension of his body. So, you find that it is not only our body, but the different things that are attached to our body, which we feel are significantly uh, associated and we start using them as well. Uh, one of them happens to be uh, social power, which is imposed and even there is a small, really, really tiny person might behave in ways which indicating uh, let us say power, display of power and so on and so forth. So, what we are going to do in this part of uh, the study, uh, uh, this part of the talk is to go in for a study. As I told you, this short talk is not a place where we can go into the details of specific nonverbal communica communication. However, the idea here was to make you aware of the very interesting dimensions of nonverbal communication one, to make you aware that once you start doing research in the field, you realize that many of the very popular notions of nonverbal communication need to be accepted with a pinch of salt. By reading five nonverbal communication popular books, you will be a better you will be better at understanding nonverbal communication. Well, that is not going to happen. 
but before we go on to this let me just point to something else uh, which is uh, not here on this slide which but which I have given you links to which is the concept of deceit. In socialization and in social space we are very often compelled to tell lies and these lies although we suppress them in our speech get reflected physiologically in some way or the other because you see that what we are feeling in our more body and mind is something which we are not trying to display which we are trying to conceal and when we do that then the body behaves in a particular way. Now this is very interestingly in the context of facial expressions which we will take up in the next session and uh, detail it out over there. But let me simply share very quickly with you that in gestures also and the way we sit and all that uh, eye contact and a few other things these displays are there. You know, when somebody is in a deceitful or lying situation the nonverbal communication also reacts in specific ways. Now some of these guidelines will be provide, provided in the links where we will discuss this in detail. I will also share with you certain interesting quizzes or you might say even challenges where I will request you to see how good you are at identifying deceit in other people. So we will do that at a later point of time. However, here in the next part we are quickly looking at nonverbal communication so that you get an idea. We cannot do all of it in this short space of the next 5 minutes, but at least I will give you an idea. If you are looking at this uh, painting by Pablo Picasso, you find that uh, the, the drooping head, the closed eyes, the languid movement of the fingers on the guitar, the, the way that the body is folded, everything suggests a sadness about the entire thing. Of course, the colors play also a significant role here. So, here is a very interesting way uh, that artists try to capture nonverbal communication and probably that is where we learn the best way to understand nonverbal communication in sociocultural contexts. Now, you see that uh, when we are looking at uh, nonverbal communication, these are the highlights we are looking at facial expression the gazing behavior, how people are looking at one another or averting the other's eyes, gestures that people make, postures they hold, arrogant postures, uh, submissive postures and things like that, head position, context and ambience, the background. So, I will show you 3 to 4 illustrations, I do not have much more time for anything else. It is a painting by Norman Rockwell 1936 and if you are looking at the painting, if I ask you a simple question, who seems to be the leader? after some thought probably you will say that this is the leader, this probably is Tom Swear and this is Huckle Finn, Huckleberry Finn, because you see that the, the posture, the leaning backward and judging the way that he is painting the fins, all those things and the hand probably on his waist, all these things suggest a sense of power whereas the other person is leaning forward and is bent with hands over his knees is suggestive of subservience to the leader who is this person. If you remember the Tintin uh, image that we analyzed earlier, there also we found something pretty similar to this that the leader was leaning backwards and the follower was leaning forward. Here is another one uh, very uh, distinctive image by Norman Rockwell. where uh, norm, uh, the, the body language is very distinctively, very subtly displayed. Somebody is propped against uh, the pillar, the pillar acts as a protection, knees close together, legs folded close, withdrawing from what he conceives to be an attack. So, this is the protection you have over here. This is one of the issues, things that you see over here and how is it that aggression is being displayed? This man over here whom you can barely see is displaying his aggression by looking very closely at this white woman in a black church. You find that there is an old woman over here with a Bible folded and he is looking obliquely at this person. This man seems to be a person who is not aggressive, but showing displaying his unhappiness assertion at the fact why is it that a white woman is inside a black church, whereas the woman is more inquisitive leaning more in that direction looking directly and the girl over here you see that although she is apparently praying and her head has not changed position, 
the eyes are looking in the other direction. So, if you are looking at this image very quickly, you find that these displays of nonverbal communication do manage to communicate significantly uh, what is being communicated or what is being attempted. I had it in mind uh, to take a test probably I will take the test uh, of these slides uh, when we are doing the online survey, but here are a couple of examples of uh, the way that uh, just by looking at images you are able to find out how people are uh, let us say predisposed or disposed. You find that uh, Captain Haddock is uh, uh, looking at this animal and uh, you see that uh, the he the, the, the animal is obviously not uh, very happy with uh, what is happening over here and uh, anger is displayed in his eyes and uh, the captain is probably not aware of it whereas Tintin is uh, looking at the entire thing amusedly at a distance okay the second image on the other hand shows uh, action and movement and whereas, this movement obviously indicates that he is Tintin is trying to chase somebody uh, which is very obvious. These are telltale displays of surprise because turning round with mouth wide open eyes staring and in this case this person is about to stand up with his hands on the desk using the desk as a support to quickly get up. Now, these are places where you find that uh, nonverbal communication does manage to communicate. If you look at the other slides as well, you will find that in each case very quickly some concept is getting suggested just through nonverbal communication, but as I told you time is short. So, we will not go into a detailed analysis of these images and we will stop here and we will focus on facial expressions in the next set of slides. Thank you very much. Thank you.